Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Andres Claro. I come from uh, Santiago, Chile. I work in the University of Chile in a program in philosophy, mainly philosophy and aesthetics. Uh, and I'm also part of a center of um, research, interdisciplinary center of research in philosophy, the arts, and uh, the humanities. Um, uh, the handout is not because I like uh, quoting uh, necessarily, it's just because I wanted to be a, a little bit testimonial on this uh, relation between repair and translation. So I'm going to take like the provocation of the program, which is the things of this pedagogies of repair, uh, actually even extended to what has been called before today epistemologies or poetics of repair, uh, and find a model that doesn't think it as simple restitution, uh, and this is a model of translation. I'm going to be basically, in a way, I mean, obliquely commenting on that picture, um, which is uh, the picture of Shevidat Hakelim, the broken of the vessels, but I'm sure I'm going to speak about the tikkun, which is the moment that comes afterwards, uh, the moment of literally repair uh, in uh, this kind of uh, myth that is a myth that was born uh, also in 1492 after uh, as a myth of exile. Well, uh, but I'm going to speak about translation and uh, amongst the testimonies, uh, which is what I'm going to privilege today, of literary translators, uh, this sort of uh, travel logs, but also of black boxes in which they relate uh, both the violence and the compensatory attempts that arise from the encounters between languages, uh, literatures and cultures. You, uh, most of you will recall uh, the well-known passage from Walter Benjamin's The Task of the Translator, where he warns the following, which is what you have translated in, uh, as quote one in page two. Benjamin writes, just as the fragments of a vessel, in order to be articulated together, must follow one another in the smallest detail, but need not resemble one another, so instead of making it, uh, itself similar to the meaning of the original, the translation must rather, lovingly and in detail, in its own language, form itself according to the way of signifying of the original. This is behavior. To make both recognizable as the broken parts of a greater language, just as fragments are the broken parts of a vessel. Well, the images uh, with which translation is figured here, which is this putting together of what is irreducibly torn, that has both restorative outputs and ethical implications, they come from the Lurianic Kabbalah, from the reflections on exile deployed by the Sephardim after the expulsion from Spain at the end of the 15th century. So this is exactly the year 1492, uh, uh, more is what's named before, uh, and the exodus from Spain. The dispersion of the historical languages, and you might want to look at that, which is Kiefer's contemporary reconstruction. Uh, the dispersion is, and of all that is constituted from the synthesis of language, so starting with subjects, communities, cultures, is figured as this shevirat hakelim, as this breaking of the vessels that were to contain the creative force after what is called the zimzum, the moment where there was kind of self-annihilation uh, of the divinity to give place to a human world. So this kind of secularization. Um, so that's the moment of the dispersion. But that tr translation itself is figured by Benjamin as the consequent tikkun, uh, which is literally repair, a task which Luria leaves exclusively in the hands of the human beings uh, and foresees that it could not consist in a simple restitution or what was there previous to this explosion, but leads to a state never before realized. As Sholem, which is the person from which Benjamin learned these doctrines, summarizes, this is what you have in quote three, the vessels which were to receive the universe from the emanation break. From the effect comes the third stage of the symbolic process, what the Kabbalists call tikkun, repair. It is true that this is by no means a straightforward process. On the contrary, it is subject to a multitude of complications. This function, that of bringing the process of tikkun to its decisive stages, is offered to the human being. In some way, the tikkun does not fully restore a conceived but unrealized idea of creation, but expresses it for the first time. <laughs> 
stuff is Benjamin's uh, most obvious intention is to determine the relationship that translation is capable of establishing between historical languages in a realm that is removed from any identical or mimetic, uh, mimetic sorry, pretensions, recognizes the irreducibility of fractures that leave ever visible traces. In an inverse but solidary, solidary direction, sorry, uh, one can interrogate and specify the very performance and output of repair as translation. More precisely, of repair as the kind of translation task Benjamin is advocating here, and folding his references to the testimonies of other literary translators who had made history, as well as his even broader reference to Tikkun Olam, that is, the repair of the world, which in modern terms employs Social, social justice, the restitution of good to another, especially to those who are suffering ongoing injustices. What imperatives would it impose to think about repair in terms of such a translative mediation between languages, subjects, cultures, recognized as irreducible differences and fractures then, where one could not pretend to proceed by similarity or by their restitution of meaning, but where the mandate would rather to be, according to Benjamin, lovingly and in detail, to host the ways of signifying, the expressive behaviours of the other, a task that ends announcing an unprecedented version of the concord between languages as a condition of understanding between human beings. Certainly, uh, answering such interrogations in an acceptable way would require much more space and time than I have available here, but let me at least sketch three or four of the imperatives that would emerge from such a task of repair as translation. Well, the first one, uh, or the more immediate one, imperative, would be to persist in the face of failure. That is, an awareness that even if the difference between the part proscribe any claim to ultimate restoration, to a possession and restitution of an identical meaning or state for the other, and the same could be said of any attempt of commensurate compensation by a currency of a different stamp. These limits do not remove the mandate of the task. This is what already someone uh, like Goethe would sum up as what you have in quote four, the contradiction between translation inherent in possibility and the absolute necessity. Or what Franz Rosenzweig, glosing the well-known Italian adagio into a self-image of service, slavery and bondage, often found in the testimonies of literary translators, would put as follows, quote five, to translate is to serve to masters. Consequently, it cannot be done. Consequently, it's like everything else that viewed ironically, so reflexively, cannot be done, but in practice, it is the task of all. Everyone must translate and everyone does it. In order to precise or even to dissolve this apparent paradox, it is worth distinguishing between what is it that fails in the repair of translation, that is, the impossible on the one hand, and what is it that is repaired in translation despite the failure, that is, the necessary on the other hand. For responding to the former means disassociating oneself from what had been, until recently, some of the dominant and common sense conceptions of what is or ought to be the restitution of translation between languages, subjects and cultures. Conceptions which often articulate a political imperialism, an ideological ethnocentrism, a literary hypertextualism and a philosophical realism and strong intentionality. Conceiving translation as the possession and transfer of the meaning, or as giving at least a commensurable equivalent of what has been lost or damaged on the way. Thus, even someone like Steiner, for all his literary erudition and sensibility, does not escape this commensurable conception of the repair of translation. To begin with, in his hermeneutic approach, he acknowledges, this is what you have as quote eight, we break a code, the cipherman is dissective, leaving the shell smashed and the vital layers striped. For a spell of density of hostile or seductive otherness is dissipated. And then in a final stage that he calls precisely compensation 
he imposes a law of semantic reciprocity between the parts, subjecting the repair of translation to a somewhat mercantile figuration of equivalence in the manner of the payment of a debt by means of a different kind of currency. He writes, quote, nine, the hermeneutic act must compensate. If it is to be authentic, it must mediate into exchange and restored parity. The enactment of reciprocity in order to restore balance is the crux of the metier and morals of translation. Confronted with the inertia of such conceptions, what some historic testimonies of literary translation teach us is that the task could not be performed in terms of identity or of equivalence. On the horizon of a similarity or universality of representation between the parts involved, but the task must be thought of in terms of irreducible differences for which asymptotic forms of creative intermediation need to be found. As Benjamin himself insists in more conceptual terms now, this is quote 10, translation, and you might think of repair here, is transposition from one language to another via a continuity of transformations. Translation governs continuous spaces of transformations and not abstract regions of equality. Or as Goethe puts it, drawing out the ethical and cultural implications of his limits, quote 11, in translation, one must get to the untranslatable and respect it. It is only then that one takes cognizance of the foreign nation. One can thus uh, start to understand why, in a sense, but only in a sense, Translation and the repair of translation must remain an impossibility. For to experience this impossibility is also to recognize what the other withholds, the unbridgeable limits that must be accepted in any relationship with another subject of culture and above all with one which has suffered violence or is suffering violence. In other words, there would be a need for mourning not only in the one who has suffered harm, but also in the one that intends to repair it. It is only thus after this initial mourning, and I'm moving now to the second uh, imperative uh, on repair on, as translational, which is on page four, that only after this uh, initial mourning, I was saying, that one can begin to answer the other pending question, namely, how translation repairs despite these irreducible differences and limits that proscribe identity or equivalence. For if the translation man that remains, you recall it is put or is understood and exercised as a receptiveness to the ways of signifying, to the expressive behaviors of the other, whose effects of arrival will often be unpredictable, even susceptible of creating violence toward what is considered one's own. Indeed, as far as the effort of hosting lovingly and in detail the other's ways of signifying, a literary translator knows well that attending to one or to some of the expressive behaviors will imply closing possibilities to others. I mean, he knows that as in any ethical task, he or she will have to transform again and again hesitation in the face of shared loyalties into a decision, in the understanding that there could be no single normative or perfect way of doing justice to the demand of the pe persons who has suffered harm. Then, as far as the outputs of such reception of expressive behaviors are concerned, one must remain open to the unintended effects they will trigger, even at the risk of violence in and toward what considers one's own. As Panvitz warns, this is quote 12, the fundamental error of the translator is that he holds fast to the incidental state of his own language instead of letting it be violently moved by the foreign. It is in the same sense that Benjamin states, quote 13, that a new and higher right of freedom in translation is reaffirmed. Its value does not derive from the meaning of the message, since the mission of fidelity is to emancipate it. Freedom becomes patent in the native language. This new right is to freedom of the other in translation, not of the translator towards the other. It consists in freeing what is confined within the foreign, a release which might provoke in turn unpredictable effects in the realm of what is considered one's own. 
Now, uh, by introducing uh, the historical dimension, and I'm moving here to the third imperative of repair in the middle of page four, the task is diachronized as the unfolding of a pending signification of the past from the perspective offered by a new moment. Where to the specific opportunities and problems arising from the difference between languages and cultures are added those deriving from the differences between times and eras. This is what Benjamin famously understood as the afterlife of translation, reformulating in a more conceptual way what had been a long tradition of images of ghostly possession, reincarnation and metempsychosis uh, through translation that abound in the testimonies of literary translation through history. Benjamin writes, quote 16 in page five, translation comes after the original. But for significant words which never find their chosen translators at the time of their creation, it designates the state of the afterlife. This sort of uh, repairing temporality as the afterlife of translation assumes a constitutive relationship between the disappearance of a certain life or death on the one hand and the mandate to unfold a certain pending signification of the past on the other above all of what has been painful, violent, the crime and the suffering of the past. As the testimony of Javier Marias puts it, quote 17, what is to the fore in the activity of translating is not the presence of the original text, but precisely its absence or lack. In taking on this task, the translator experiences the original text as an absence. Once again, this does not mean that the moment or the outcome of this receptiveness to the pending past can be anticipated subjectively, planned for by the mere intentional will of the translator. Uh, the figure in here uh, is a kind of secular uh, revelation from the negativity of history. Thus, for instance, Benjamin quoting a very well known and non less suggestive analogy of uh, Monglons in the Arcades Projects warns the following. Quote 18, in literary text, the past has bequeathed images of itself comparable to those left by light on a sensitive plate. Only the future is in possession of developers powerful enough to bring out these negatives. The historiography of repair as translation would have to be attentive to the propitious moment in the relationship with the other in time. If, as Benjamin also puts it, Quote 19, the historian is the herald who invites the dead to his table. He or she must respond when the bell of history unexpectedly rings and open wide the doors of the present to an unannounced eruption from another era, to the signification that a pending past imposes as a task to the present. Um, I'm going to skip uh, imperative four because I'm, I'm almost reaching my time now. Um, I just will and by saying that uh, this kind of uh, limit uh, to the pretending possession and uh, recreation of the sense of the other, but rather the opening to hosting behavior, expressive behavior, uh, uh, irrespective of what the, uh, the effects are on what one considers wrongly one's own. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, while it's diachronized as this historical afterlife, projects a sort of new model of, um, of, uh, of crossbreeding. I mean, it projects the language as a language of crossbreeding that can become a very different model from the uh, enlightened universal language or from the romantic original language to build everything that we think or still think is constituted in language, starting from subjects, uh, communities, etc., which can be thought of as this kind of crossbreeding uh, with this cross-breeding uh, uh, foundations, which will mean that from any, any subject, from the moment that expresses his own I, uh, there's many traditions, many genealogies being uh, uh, um, be put in stage there, and all, all the more so for the community. Uh, so this would be uh, what the eruption, uh, or the interruption rather, of Babel uh, will still teach us today, uh, with this imaginary of Babel of irreducible fragmentation incompleteness and human dispersion, uh, with its very articulation of that uh, old myth of the necessities of repair and the necessities of translation in a conception that defies all the fantasies of identical, controllable, or even 
commensurable restitution. So that's what I finished saying. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and uh, um, I will just, so I'll put this in the background. This was my, my alternative PhD. Well, um, um, I'll talk a little bit about it uh, shortly. So I do not mention the word repair um, because it is inadequate to express the process. Uh, words like recover, restore, reconstruct, repatriate, repatri reparation, um, as an African uh, or, or as a black African, repairing is part of my being, uh, part of my breathing, part of doing. Uh, but often I'm, I'm expected to do the work for, for, for an oppressive system, uh, help you to formulate a language for, for lang a language for atonement. So I, yeah, I'm just going to tell you stories like anecdotally. Um, and in, that, in those stories, I'll be talking about my, the processes in, in, um, and the ways in which I move through archives. So my actual PhD uh, was, a, was a comparative reading of Shelley um, and Marichera. So two, Zimbab two writers, one from Zimbabwe, one from England. Um, and my, my PhD was very interpretive, very secondary. Um, for many years, I, I had visited the Schwarzman building uh, of the New York Public Library. Um, so upstairs on the third floor, there's a, a, a room that is always locked. So room 319. So it's the Faisaima. It's uh, the Shelley and Diseko um, archive. So for many years, I didn't know how to, how to I was afraid of, of uh, confronting Shelley and Diseko. So I always stood outside the wind, outside the door. I always peeked through. Um, I wanted to get in. I'd, you know, spend years reading Shelley. I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to move in. I didn't know how to occupy the space. Um, and um, I eventually got a, a New York Public Library short research uh, fellowship. And I got a panic attack when I when I was supposed to attend, uh, or at least spend time in this room. But once I breached the barrier, um, I was mesmerized by the opulence. Uh, Shelley occupies in the archive, whether it's in New York, it's in Oxford. Um, so when you, yeah, so I will, I will, to, I will gesture towards those things. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that when I visit archives, and here I, I mean mostly African writers' archives, um, when I visit arch archives, I'm not oblivious to the fact that these are now the new minerals being extracted from Africa in mass. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is this project um, was the first time I started learning how to read archives. Um, I almost didn't get my PhD um, and I had to create a job for myself. Um, and I built this platform and I started, uh, yeah, f learning how to read archives, started publishing. And I'll talk a little bit, I'll show some of the, some of the work that I've been doing uh, through archives which is, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you shortly. Okay, so I, 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 that was just like my f framing. I'm just going to read for like a few minutes. Um, so the straight line distance or airline route from Oxford to Harare, Zimbabwe is 8,345 kilometers or 5,186 miles or, or 4,506 nautical miles. It may seem like a world away, but I inhabit that distance. It grounds the approach my work takes. I'm not just theorizing a place, but I'm also of the place. I do not just theorize the north-south divide. I leave it and I engage it. So I want to take you, to a short, I want to take you on a short tour of the city where I was born to one street in particular that connects and extends the city in many directions and in many ways. Imagine Harare as a pair of lungs. Harare is the capital of Zimbabwe. Samoroma Show Avenue is where the two lungs meet. The avenue cuts a roughly diagonal line that separates Zimbabwe and Harare and the city's townships. 
in one direction, it takes you all the way to his homeland, Mozambique, and in the opposite direction, to South Africa. This divide can also be located in the cultural production of the city. The South, with its poverty, periodic typhoid outbreaks, and overcrowding, um, has inspired a form of music with Jamaican influence, popularly known as Zim Dancehall. Meanwhile, the northern suburbs, where the affluent live, the government officials, the diplomats, the experts, there's also there is a thriving cottage industry producing the country's hip hop and rap music. It is here in Samura Mashio Avenue, where the president of Zimbabwe is his office. The courtyard has a statue of David Livingstone looking into the street. A monument, Robert Mugabe, and his successor, Emerson Nangagwa, have had to first and, pay, and secretly pay homage to, even when they say Zimbabwe will never be a colon again. Armed soldiers patrol the parameters of this building, inaugurated during the colonial times. Samura Machel, the icon of Mozambican liberation, has become a gatekeeper of class and power in contemporary Zimbabwe. He's not the only one. The city streets are named and owned by a few entitled men of the past. Josiah, um, Nelson Mandela, Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, as well as um, Zimbabwean heroes like Josiah Chinamano, Hepe Chitepo, Jason Moyo, George Silindika, Josiah Tongogara, Joshua Nkomo. But these heroes are increasingly difficult to locate in our country's vaults of history. Apart from being street names, their autobiographies, biographies, and memoirs remain unpublished, elusive, or non-existent. They are acknowledged only as supporting figures to the heroes who currently occupy office. The streets in Harare, therefore, functions as a site of burial, a place where dead, hero, dead heroes are left to hang in public as silent witnesses. This dead archive is reactivated only periodically for political expediency. It suffers from a lack of narrative. These heroes cannot speak, but they are spoken for. Even though they are memorialized on street signposts, they've become footnotes in the history of Zimbabwe. In their silence, they've led me to search for them, to trace them across the world, following their exilic wanderings through Asia, Europe, North America, and back to Zimbabwe. The war to liberate Zimbabwe extended to neighboring countries such as Mozambique and Zambia, to ideological and military bases in China and Russia, and to universities and seminaries in America and Britain. As a consequence of this global dispersion, the Zimbabwean archive is scattered and fragmented. For a long time, I was blissfully ignorant of the archive. It was a foreign concept that didn't mean anything beyond colonial and political records. My university education in Zimbabwe had only taught me that knowledge is secondary. It is interpretive that someone else has the power to look at the primary source, the archive. Our colonial inheritance of knowledge told us that the book is the ultimate form of knowledge. Um, but as a literary scholar, I believe that narratives may be one best, exam uh, best available form of redress for these monument, for monumental crimes of history. I think of my work as bridging theory and narrative. I'm very committed to a storied articulation of ideas. So I mainly work on, with, through write, uh, writers' archives because they're a perfect counterpoint to the political archive I mentioned earlier. It's an unsettling experience. I encounter uh, these African writers uh, as vulnerable and defenseless um, in the archives, which are mostly in, in Europe and North America. More often than not, they are geographically displaced, uprooted, and buried in foreign lands. Their lives are reduced into objects stacked in boxes or subjects flattened uh, into files. I start my work with names of familiar figures. Uh, so I work a lot on Dambuzo Marichera, for example. Um, so I, okay, I start my work with familiar names of, fam uh, names of familiar figures like Nambuzo Marichera, hoping to meet them. On occasion, I'm lucky and embraced by them and they take me under their wings. But sometimes they're, too they're also too desperate to be found because they cannot recognize themselves from the constellation of fragments that are labeled with their names. 
but many times they always lead me to unknown, pers unknown persons, nameless figures as ensembles, collectives, multitudes, or what Sadia Hartman calls the chorus. That's where my imagination of practice resides. That's where my heart resides. I started moving in the archive naively. The excitement of discovery was euphoric, but once I sobered and became clear-sighted, a certain violence always creeped into my body. Uh, made me shiver or sometimes violently sick. Migraines, racing, a racing heart, disorientation. When these physical manifestations happened, I knew that my approach to, my approach had to change. That the only way to read, um, to read the black archive for me was with my whole body, so sensorially, and by activating all the five senses. Um, so five senses, taste, hearing, touch, uh, sight, smell, touch. Once I started doing that, the process became more generative. The archives began, began to be more giving to me. The subjects started communi communicating themselves. They became interlocutors and collaborators. Where before they were trapped in basements in Oxford or Texas or Florida, I started creating escape routes. They started, I started creating escape routes for them and they started taking me back to their communities, to meet their families, to meet their readers. These are dissident acts engineered by the subjects, by the figures themselves, because they are captives against their wills. Sometimes I'm reminded by the archive holders, that is the institutions and those who preside over them, that I'm the wrong person looking at the materials, that my presence and familiarity with the subject is uncomfortable or I'm just an extension of, the, of, the, of that very archive. Working with the archive became a way to inhabit historical time, a sense of temporary uh, entanglement where the past, the present, and the future are not discrete or cut off from each other. When Damuzo Marichera was fighting with his tutors here at Oxford in the 1970s, he said he was bored with the objective study of literature because he preferred the personal approach. And the personal here does not just mean himself, um, but his community, his country, his continent. I too refuse this forced detachment from the self. Even though my body is in Oxford and my institutional affiliation is with the University of Oxford, I exercise the power to detach from this place and multiply myself into the world because that is the only way to survive and protect my imagination and my mental space. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Wes and I are going to do um, an unplanned, unrehearsed uh, double act. Um, <laughs> um, similar to you, Tineshe, um, the notion of repair um, is a constant, often unconscious mode in which I've been creating and making work. Um, in the last 10 years. Um, Still Breathing was the latest project um, for me, uh, which I've been creating in the last uh, six, seven years around exploring the black diaspora's struggles for uh, justice, freedom uh, and equality. Um, out of Still Breathing, um, a project uh, evolved, um, which was Finding Our Way, which is a, a knowledge exchange project with both uh, uh, Oxford Brookes University and Torch, uh, which Wes will talk about a bit, a bit later on. Um, to repair, for me, to repair is to, is to make better, to mend, uh, to piece together, uh, to heal, to restore. Um, and for me, living in the, in U in the UK in the 21st century, um, this restoring, this healing, is neither historical nor retrospective, um, but a present living, live um, way of being and, and operating. And although this living, live thing um, is current, it's, it's deeply rooted in, in, in the past, in the histories of the past, because uh, it's that past, for me, that is deeply affecting the present. Um, so why is repair necessary? Summer 2022 saw a wave of support for uh, Black Lives Matter. 
Um, uh, uh, here in the UK, a lot of that was kickstarted around uh, the murder, the public execution of George Floyd. Um, and then later with, with COVID, a lot of the um, COVID reports and the health reports that came out um, showing a dis this, uh, disproportionality of um, the effects on uh, people of colour. Um, at the same time, there were other things that related to um, schools, school exclusion, for example, in the UK, um, which is quite high for um, particularly boys of colour, particularly black boys, um, and a link to um, that exclusion showing a direct correlation to the link between the numbers of those um, people excluded and, and, and ended up in the penal institution, um, what they refer to as the, the education to prison pipeline. So these, so these things are, are happening all, all around me as an individual within that community, but also as a theatre maker and having to make decisions and choices in terms of how one goes about creating and making work within this evolving context um, that's happening all the time around me. Uh, and it, it's true to say that um, Still Breathing wasn't the show I was going to write next and do next, but it felt that was a show I needed to do, so abandoned plans and, and, and develop that project. Also at the same time, uh, in 2020, there was a whole wave of um, institutions and organisations uh, putting out statements and, and slogans about, we support Black Lives Matter. And I'm going to give an example of, of one um, uh, in which it sort of showed the true nature of that, really. And it concerns one of the museums here in, in Oxford, I won't name, but it'll probably come apparent, um, who, who put out one of these statements, um, we support Black Lives Matter to which um, somebody retweeted on it. Well, if that's the case, give back to people the things that you've tef, you've stolen from them. And instead of engaging in that conversation, they took the tweet down. Okay. So why is our lives, our black lives, so undervalued? Um, again, in 2020, um, Ofcom got, it's, got the most, um, what they call it, um, uh, uh, things when you know when you're writing complaints um, uh, about a show that ITV had put out because um, it, it in in that show Britain Got Talent um, diversity which is a hip hop uh, troupe a black hip hop troupe um, did the history their de their depiction of the history of the Black Lives Matter movement and it had people up in arms about it. How dare they show this on national television at prime time and on live television. And to ITV's credit, instead of re responding in a way that this museum had, of taking it down or, or saying, we're sorry, we didn't know they were gonna do that, they actually went the opposite. And they took out a national, a large national um, sp uh, spread in the newspaper advert, um, uh, stating this, this second quote. Um, we are changed by what we see, just as we are changed when we are seen, supporting what those artists had, had done. And it was a very positive statement um, for a lot of people. Whilst uh, recognising that um, uh, Europe, the European colonists, colonialists did not invent slavery, they did create a unique cruel brand in which the British took it to a new level. Uh, and that level of being shattered slavery, and the legacy of which I still believe we are living under, not just for me as a black person, but every one of us here, and particularly somewhere like, um, like, um, uh, like Oxford, that legacy can be seen left, right and center around us, and that generational wealth that came from that. So where, how do I begin to address any of those things in, in my work? Um, I'm, I'm drawn to the fact that uh, being of uh, the, the Windrush generation and also uh, coming to this country in, as, a, as a near 10 year old in 66, I'm still drawn to the fact and trying to understand why Jamaica as the only country with a British monarch as its head of state still requires us to get a visa to enter this country. None of the other Commonwealth countries do. Why is that? Okay. 
I do, I'll do a lot of this in my production as well. I ask questions that just provide the answers. <laughs> Those are questions. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the David Lemmer report, which looked at the um, of why um, uh, black children were so disproportionately represented in in the numbers of um, stop and search, the the prison uh, education to prison pipeline, the number of uh, the fact that they're disproportionately tasered, um, and, not, and that's both boys and girls. And the latest report around the numbers of black girls who are um, also strip search, um, uh, also without any proper rep representation, um, and the sexualization of, those, of, of the black female. Um, so the, David Lamy put out this report and five years later, he revisited it. And, and in fact, none of the statistics had got lower that actually got worse, that actually increased. So however much as a country we, we talk about the progressive nature and about making change and about um, moving forward, something fundamentally is not changing, is not shifting as to why the groundwork is still the same and getting worse. Um, the recently, um, for those from the States may not be aware that the Met Office uh, acknowledged finally that it was both um, racist, sexist, and homophobic, and pledged that it will look, relook back at some of those um, uh, previous cases um, that had not been resolved or not been resolved satisfactory uh, to the victims. Yet it Can was. Can do a bit of translation here? Yes. Met Office does not mean weather. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it means. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe this is obvious, but it means the Metropolitan Police. Yes, In other words, the London yes, Police. Yeah. yeah. London. <laughs> I mean, maybe the yes, weather. Yes, the is... weather. The weather. <laughs> Thanks, Wes. Um, and that it was going to relook at some of those cases, but there was out of the three categories, the one category that it, that it says it was not going to relook at and touch was all the ones to do with race. And one ends up asking himself, but why? Why not? You know. Um, particularly in the light recently of last year, uh, last summer, uh, the, the, again another shooting of Chris Cabber. Um, who was shot through his windscreen, stationary windscreen window at point blank range. And still a year on, the family is still waiting for some outcome of that police investigation as to what happened and why, and why did that happen? And we, we, you look, um, as we look around us, we see, we, we are, we are, uh, there's a thing in the black community, so why are we the most tasered race, which I think is a, is a joke Chris Rock um, has done. Why are we the most tasered race in the in the in the universe? But also, if you look at all those mass massacres, those um, school shootings and things that happened um, around the world, particularly in America, um, when they happen with a, someone of colour, inevitably that person ends up being shot or killed or maimed in some way. When they happen by someone who is not of colour, there's not even a mark on them, and that's not an interpretation. That's a, that is a fact. They are somehow captured um, without injury. And it's the other way around. Someone of color, they're in inevitably maimed or killed um, in some way. And you ask yourself, why, why is that? Um, why here in the UK uh, uh, do we not afford the same treatment that we've given to, to, to the Ukrainians, uh, to people of color who are fleeing Sudan or Afghanistan? Uh, I'm not saying stop the Ukrainian, I'm saying why, aren't, why can't the same treatment be, 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 be afforded to people of colour? So we, we constantly live in, in the history of the past that is reflecting itself in current policies and practices and ways of being. So still breathing and the resultant, resultant, resolver, resultant finding our way project that came out of that utilises um, performance and art uh, to engage in conversations, and we often refer to them as difficult conversations for people to have. Because one of the things that, that um, over the last three years, been, been doing quite a lot of, um, uh, of teachings and things around uh, race, is that Britain as a nation finds it very difficult to discuss that concept of race. It just does not engage with it in the way other people did. Um, uh, we don't have, as we did in the show, in the extract we did, we don't have the equivalent of the, um, the, the memorial um, that was shown there in Paris. We don't have the equivalent of the Holocaust Museum in, in Germany. There is, there is no, or the equivalent in America of some of the plantation that gets turned into museums. We don't have any, any, any way of recalling and remembering those histories.
Um, so still breathing was a choice when we when we put together of not of not playing this in a traditional theatre space, and so we played it in um, in three places so far in Oxford. The full production at the Sheldonian Theatre, um, which Wes will tell you a bit about in a second, and then extracts at the Ashmolean Museum, and an extract at All Souls College, um, which hosts which was formerly the um, Codrington Library. So I'm going to pass over to Wes, just give you a sense of yeah. audience re relationship to those spaces yeah. and how the show related in those spaces. Yes, yeah, so I'll just talk very briefly because I understood that part of the point of moving these conversations about repair from place to place was to think about the place itself in which that was happening. And that's, that's really what, what both Tunashe's uh, intervention and um, ours uh, with the month that has been about, which is, um, as Newton said, Oxford itself is a very uh, divided, uh, uh, it's a place that, that has a range of colonial legacies uh, very strongly written into uh, the walls in ways that we were talking about, um, but also simply in the presence of the walls, but also in the archives, in the libraries, um, in the museums, in, in the public places that, that matter most to Oxford. So it seemed to us useful um, from the position of Torch um, uh, and, of, and the, the kind of new ambition uh, for Torch uh, in the last couple of years, which is both to sort of engage more directly with creative practitioners of various kinds and more directly to reflect on um, uh, histories of, of exclusion many different kinds of histories of exclusion, but in particular in relation to race. Um, so we thought together, um, how might we intervene? How might we do some of the work of repair within the university itself? And it seemed to us that the first thing to do was to identify the three locations in the university that have great symbolic capital. So the Sheldonian is where you go and get your degree. It's where the uh, and senior where, where all the university uh, fellows and so on meet. It's, it's, it's the symbolic kind of icon of the university. You'll see it on all the university stuff. Okay, let's, have, let's do the show in there, number one. The second one is the Ashmolean Museum. Um, it's not the one that actually Newton was just talking about, I don't think, but it is nonetheless a museum, which is, again, iconic, central to Oxford. Um, and... Um, has a public engagement program, but not one that really extends beyond a very particular public. So um, an amazing piece of work was done um, involving uh, various garments. We were talking about garments earlier today, uh, for example, in the Ashmolean. And you can in fact still see some of that work in um, a public exhibition space uh, over by the, 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 the central uh, Gloucester Green. Um, and then the third one was, at, was All Souls itself. So All Souls is kind of the Holy of Holies in Oxford in college terms. Um, it's also the Codrington Library, as it used to be called. Um, they changed the name, um, but precisely did not take down the statue of Codrington in the middle of the library. All of that is plantation money. Um, uh, and so after two years of conversations, I think, with, the shelter, with um, All Souls, um, we finally, thanks to um, some important advocates within the college, um, we were given permission um, to do, uh, to produce uh, part of the show in All Souls. Um, uh, and I would just say as an audience member, rather than sort of somebody trying to make this happen, what was most powerful about that, and this comes back to something you said um, about, as it were, the form of Christian ritual being reimagined or reused. Um, was that the way they organised, the way you organised the show, was around the statue. Um, and in a sense, very straightforwardly, you reclaimed that statue and made it through the, you know, uh, our names, for example, that song that you were singing here, and through the list of names of uh, black, uh, not only young people, but people who had been killed uh, within the UK, uh, um, but even more specifically within Oxford in the last few years, um, 
didn't just turn the statue into a commemoration of some antique past, but made the statue that they won't take down itself into an emblem um, or a kind of memorial site for the people for whom that statue was not built. So there was a kind of reimagining, uh, a, a, a repair, a reclamation of, uh, of one of the, the key sites of Oxford. Um, and I have to say on the back of that performance, amongst other things, um, there is also reparation in a much more kind of uh, financial sense. All Souls is now happily through Torch, um, establishing, uh, hoping to establish, uh, well, establishing um, uh, a set of um, scholarships, but also um, a, a kind of um, a way of directly connecting with not only um, universities in the Caribbean, but also um, uh, schools and uh, other artists within Oxford um, of Caribbean heritage. Um, so there's, you know, these things can make a difference. And we're about to engage in another conversation with them in the autumn uh, around what more they can do um, and looking at, hopefully I think they'll be up for it, changing the wording on their website because mm -hmm. the wording is still, terms of talk, people talk about language earlier, is still very much uh, a colonial one. Um, uh, for example, the very simple plaque that you went to the library is um, in memory of those who worked on the plantation. Um, if someone winched straight away, you can see why. <laughs> so even just getting them to rechange some of those word, word and language. But the conversation started, which would never have thought two years ago that that would happen. Um, so space is important to us, but also for the African Caribbean community, the fact that there's something like over 2,500 um, mu major museums uh, in the country, in the UK, yet not one permanent single um, museum for um, people of colour. Um, here in, here in, in Oxford, there is not one space that is managed and owned, cultural space managed and owned by the African Caribbean community. Uh, and, and until that happens, I think we're continually shouting, we're tired, we're tired, and time to do something else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, mm, 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 mm.